Okay, terrific. I'll, I'll be brief and I'll try to get us back on time. And one thing that'll help me a lot is how many of you know what a Pascal is? Okay, how many do not know what a Pascal is? Excellent, okay, good. So, so here's what I want to try to do. I want to try to give you a little introduction in, into the kind of jargon of uh, biomechanics, uh, at least uh, insofar as it's used for animal cells and soft uh, tissues and soft materials in general, and then to give you a couple of uh, examples of where, um, mostly in animal cells, cells are subjected to either changes in their material properties or subjected to forces where the material properties are important. Um, and a couple of illustrations of how big a biological role these mechanical features play. Uh, uh, so, uh, as Becky said, I'm Paul Janmay. It's my email address if you... Uh, uh, the lecture notes are longer than what I'm going to tell you about, so uh, uh, feel free to contact me or, or look up the kind of cheat sheets that are in some slides coming up. So, here's a couple of examples of, 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 of kind of the material science of, of biomaterials and how, how interesting it is. This is a colorized... Uh, scanning EM of a whole blood clot. So these are red cells, they're about you know, five or six microns in diameter. They're trapped in this turquoise network that are made out of fiber, the polymer that forms when you clot your blood. And these little purple guys are platelets, cells that don't really contribute very much mass to the, to the uh, clot, but what they do is they hang on to the uh, turquoise polymer strands and put tension on them. And one of the things that people uh, have known for, for a very long time is that if you don't have patient, uh, uh, platelets or patients with defective platelets, uh, they can still make this clot, but it's about 10 times softer than it is if you have these active platelets. So the platelets, again, aren't really contributing mass. What they're doing is they're, they're hanging onto these uh, fibers and pulling on them. And that uh, makes the, uh, the stuff much softer. One of the surprising things is the physics behind that. Why does internal tension change the stiffness of a biomaterial? Uh, that was only figured out maybe five or ten years ago, even though the phenomenon has been known uh, forever. And the, the, this is true both for the cytoskeleton and these extracellular matrices, which you'll hear more about. Uh, and it governs a lot about the uh, mechanics of, of tissues. So one of the reasons that the mechanics of tissues is important is because most cells in the uh, body are, and even unicellular organisms, they're constantly subjected to some kind of force. You know, gravitational force, your muscle contraction, or other things that are slightly more subtle. So for example, here's a uh, computer simulation or a reconstruction of a bifurcating uh, blood vessel. So if, the, if the, the fluid is flowing and it branches into a vessel, the way that the fluid flows and the, and the streamlines of the, um, uh, the blood, the cells and everything uh, whizzing by are um, um, complicated looking. And that uh, force of the fluid going by the top surface of the endothelial cell exerts a, a stress, a, a mechanical force on the cells. And if you can uh, compute what the fluid uh, uh, mechanics should look like in these kind of bifurcated things. You can show that there are very large um, changes. This is kind of a heat map of the shear stress that cells would feel uh, within uh, this kind of arterial structure. And you can see that these shear stresses are quite different. And they're not just different in magnitude, uh, they're different in terms of whether they feel a uniform force or whether it's pulsatile as the blood pressure changes, whether the blood is going in a straight line or whether it's circulating. And places where the force is disturbed are hot spots for developing atherosclerotic uh, uh, problems. And people have uh, uh, done a lot of measurement of these cells. I'll, I'll show you this again. This is uh, uh, later. This is just a cell being sucked into a, 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 a tube. And so people have tried very hard to figure out uh, clever ways to measure either the stiffness of something like a blood clot, which is relatively easy, or the stiffness of these arteries, which is a little bit harder, or the stiffness of a single cell, which is uh, a whole uh, order of magnitude harder. And uh, uh, an illustration, which I'll show you again later, is, is how important not only the forces that, that uh, um, cells feel, but the stiffness of the material on which they are adherent or in which they are embedded. So here's one example. Uh, these are all, I think, fibroblasts. Um, and they're all chemically identical uh, medium. It's the same uh, cell line. It's even the same culture dish. The only difference is that these cells are sitting on materials that 
range from very, very soft, about as soft as uh, mucus or, or, or uh, um, uh, fat, uh, to things that are stiffer, not super stiff, but uh, about as stiff as a muscle. And as you increase the stiffness, the phenotype of the cell changes, the cytoskeletal changes, the area changes, all kinds of stuff changes simply in response to the stiffness. And 99.9% .9 of what we know about cell biology is for cells that are sitting not on something as stiff as a muscle, but on this uh, scale over in the next room, something as stiff as glass or plastic. And so that abnormal um, stiffness is um, uh, something that people have recently gotten uh, really interested in. Okay, so and again, here's sort of in words the motivation for why uh, this is an interesting thing to study. And that is that most cells, most tissues in the body have a surprisingly well-controlled stiffness. And, and in the next couple slides, I'll, I'll kind of uh, unpack or pack up this uh, uh, notion of stiffness and, and, uh, and, and try to make that more quantitative and precise. But you know from your own intuition that some parts of your body are stiffer than others. And, uh, but that stiffness is surprisingly well controlled. Uh, it's, uh, it changes during development, it changes during disease, but if you take animals of the same type, of the same age, and the same uh, uh, state of health, they have a remarkably um, similar stiffness. The variance is pretty small. Where that stiffness comes from isn't uh, clear. It doesn't just derive from the cells. So cells do not have a genetically encoded program to tell them that once you grow up, you're going to be this, this stiff. That's not true. The cells are remarkably adaptable and can change their own stiffness by a factor of 10 or so, depending on what their environment is. And so there's this feedback between the cell and its environment that determines the stiffness. And where that comes from is, is kind of an interesting problem. Um, okay, and the reason, again, that, that this is interesting is that, is that these physical f effects, the forces that, that cells feel, the forces they put on the material around them, the stiffness and the resistance of that material, those things all will generate um, internal signals like, like, like Rick, Rick talked about that, that are just as uh, specific and just as chemically and genetically encoded as responses to chemical agonists like growth factors or you know, anything else. Okay, and again, there's this, this uh, um, uh, thing in red that has driven a lot of work and that is uh, that the tumors are often stiffer than uh, non-malignant tissue. It's not always true, but it's, but it's often true. And this has really driven a lot of research in the area. And, and, but from our point of view, it would be nice to understand what are the physical principles uh, that make the stiffness. And, and if we understood that, we could do something about it. OK, so um, this just shows you what I told you in words. Um, and, but I do want to show you this example from Becky Wells's lab of just how remarkably big this, uh, uh, this change can be. So liver is one of the organs that changes stiffness when it gets diseased. So dur during development of fibrosis uh, in the liver, the liver tissue, if you just take a little sample out and measure its stiffness, it's about 10 times stiffer than the normal uh, 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 tissue. Um, and, and in tumors, this is also true. If you take a piece of non-malignant uh, 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 tissue, either from the breast or from the liver as well, if you take a piece of of non-diseased liver from the same person and then look at the tumor, that tumor is often much stiffer than some piece of the tissue a couple of centimeters away. And that stiffness itself isn't just a consequence of having a disease, it seems to be helping to drive the disease process. And so here's one of the more spectacular uh, examples of how much a cell can change when you change the um, stiffness, the elastic modulus, uh, which I'll tell you about in the next couple slides. Uh, but just as, as intuition, uh, uh, about 400 pascal, that's about the stiffness of a normal liver. So even if you just go to the food store and you pick up a piece of liver, um, that's something like a few hundred, maybe a thousand pascal. But a really fibrotic liver is out here someplace. And uh, what the Wells lab has done is just taken a, a cell type from the liver, a hepatic stellate cell, that looks kind of brownish here because it's storing fat-soluble vitamins. It has fat droplets in it. And it's not a particularly photogenic cell. It's just this little blob of, of stuff. Uh, but if you culture this thing on materials that are chemically identical, as, as far as anyone knows, um, 
they just differ in stiffness. As you make the stiffness bigger and bigger to be to start resembling that of a diseased fibrotic liver, this thing spontaneously changes its phenotype and becomes all stellate-like. And it, it's not just changing its shape, it's changing all kinds of transcription programs, changing its ra rate of proliferation, all kinds of stuff happens. Uh, and, and what exactly happens is people have just scratched the surface of. So how the cell knows that it's sitting on something soft and something stiff, that's not known. And what all is happening when it goes from here to there is also not, uh, not known. OK. Uh, any questions so far? OK, so now let me see if I can get a little bit into uh, uh, the kind of physics behind this. So the way these experiments are done, and maybe some of you are doing this, instead of, and it's a re remarkably simple um, um, uh, idea, is that instead of growing cells on a glass cover slip, which people have done for decades, because the cells are really pretty and you can look at them in a microscope and it's easy, um, instead of doing that, you put a little cushion of a hydrogel or something um, um, that has approximately the same stiffness as the uh, tissue that that cell came from. And then put the adhesion molecules that uh, you've already heard about so that the cell can engage its integrins or other adhesion proteins. Uh, it can't engage it to anything. It needs to have specific proteins in order to uh, bind. You put those proteins on top and then see what happens. And I um, can't resist showing you this. This is not, uh, that the stellate cell that I showed you is one spectacular example. But I don't, but it's not always true that the cell changes sort of monotonically. It's not true that cells just go from round to spread as you increase stiffness. There's often an optimal stiffness that a cell wants to see in some sense. And so one illustration of this comes from uh, cardiac myocytes. So these are myocytes that are taken out of a neonatal rat um, whose heart has a stiffness just around here, about 5 to 10 kilopascal. So in the heart tissue, the cell was elongated, has these striated uh, um, uh, actin, actomyosin fibers, and it beats. Okay? So that's what it looked like when it was in a three-dimensional heart. So you dissolve the heart, you blow all these cells out of it, and now put them back on surfaces. If you put them on glass, you get this beautiful, um, interesting looking cell that has uh, a nice cytoskeleton, it's metabolically kind of okay, but it doesn't look anything like a muscle cell. Uh, and if you put it on something that's very, very soft, uh, softer than a muscle, uh, than the muscle from which it came, the cells again can adhere and they can sort of make these uh, amorphous like cytoskeleton things, but they're not functioning myocytes. They don't do what a muscle does. And somewhat surprisingly, if you get the stiffness right, that's all you need to do. You need to give them some anchor for their integrins and you need to give them the chemicals that'll you know, keep them uh, metabolically happy. But you just have to get the stiffness right and they'll, they'll immediately make these uh, nicely uh, elongated cells. There's no micro patterning. There's nothing underneath it. It's a uniform surface. But once the cells feel the right uh, resistance, they will uh, uh, do what they're programmed to do. Yes? Does the contractile force change significantly between the 10 kilopascal and the gigapascal? Yeah, it does. It does. And many cell types do this. So the, uh, the, in general, I believe that for most cells, the stiffer the substrate, the harder they pull. And it's a little bit um, uh, uh, tricky. I mean, that's, it's a little bit oversimplified to say that because as you change the stiffness um, too far, the morphology of the cell changes. And so the signaling is different. The adhesion sites are different. So the traction forces may be, I mean, the traction forces that they put on the substrate are clearly a function of what the cell morphology is like. but. This cell would pull slightly harder in this one. And, and it's not clear whether different muscle cells, whether as you change the stiffness, whether the beat frequency changes or the amplitude of the contraction changes. Um, it, it seems as though the amplitude of the contraction does not change and the frequency does not change. And because the amplitude doesn't change and this is stiffer, it's doing more work during a contraction cycle, more or less. Uh, but eventually, you can make the stiffness so, so resistant that it can no longer 
pull during its whole contractile cycle. And so this is one of the things that may happen in, in damaged hearts where a piece of the dead tissue becomes too stiff. Even the surviving cells that are now forced to pull on this abnormally stiff environment, they pull, but there's a limit to how strong these sarcomeres are. And if they can't contract, then bad things will happen downstream of that. Yeah, so they'll beat, and they will, um, and sometimes, and it's true that sometimes they will make elongated structures. It's not always that they look so fibroblasty, but the fraction of cells that look okay are, um, is not so good, and they will beat. So this, this cell also beats, and th they will make little um, structures that locally will, will beat. Uh, but they don't uh, coordinate all of their structures so they get one big unifying uniaxial contraction. So they have the machinery to do it and part of the, of the um, program is to align all those tiny little um, beating sarcomeres into one big coordinated thing. Okay, so I want I uh, to shift gears a little bit and tell you a little bit about how, how stiffness is measured and, and, and what all uh, what exactly is uh, um, going into measurements of stiffness? Because yeah, the, the generic notion of stiffness is a very oily term, right? There's not, what, be, what you mean by stiffness is, is uh, um, different in different contexts. But by and large, there are really only two ways that people measure the mechanical properties of soft biological things, or most things. You could either put a sample in between two plates, and in this case it's a cone shape on one side and a flat uh, disc on the other side, but the sample is this red thing. This top thing could also have been flat. So you put a little flat disc shaped uh, object in between two plates and you oscillate one of the plates uh, um, uh, with respect to the other. And you look at how much force does it take to give a certain angle of displacement. Uh, and you can either do that by putting a steady force and looking at how much the deformation is, or you can oscillate it and look at how much force it takes to give a certain amplitude of oscillation. So these kinds of measurements where you put a cell, put a, put a material in between uh, uh, two surfaces and you put force on one surface that is parallel to the surface of the material, that's called a shear force and that defines a shear modulus, often called G. Oftentimes you can't do this because um, it typically takes like a centimeter or at least a few millimeter size sample in order to adhere the plates and then torque them. It's much easier to put uniaxial forces uh, or point forces on a material. So the, a, a very common way to do these measurements is to take some kind of um, uh, poking device. It could either be a flat bottom thing or a thing with a with a cone. The geometry of the indenter is very important uh, and what you do is you push into the uh, into the sample or you could uh, uh, glue it on and pull up and you put a uniaxial force and you look at how much you indent or you stretch and that defines this this uniaxial deformation and uh, stretch defines the so-called Young's modulus. And so those two things are different from each other, uh, but for simple materials, they can be related to each other. Okay, so the, the minimal jargon that is uh, kind of really useful to know is, is pretty much this. There are really only two um, parameters that define stiffness. One is, called, one is stress and the other is strain. So in order to deform anything, you have to apply a force to it. And the more force you put on, the more the thing should deform. But the amount of force that it takes to deform an object also depends on how big the object is. Uh, so, or how big an area that force is distributed over. So you know from your own right, intuition, if you uh, uh, take a really sharp needle or a really blunt needle and you push with the same amount of force, one is gonna hurt more than the other and one will puncture your skin better than the other. And the reason that is that, if you, that the force that you apply to a surface isn't enough to, to determine how much the, the material is going to deform. You have to divide the force by the area of the material over, that force is dis, over which that force is distributed. Uh, so force divided by area is stress. Um, so force in SI units is uh, Newton 
uh, area is uh, square meter. Uh, and uh, uh, Newton divided by um, meter squared is a Pascal. Okay, so, okay, so that's useful to know. Um, and, but a Pascal, a meter per, uh, sorry, a Newton per meter squared is kind of a useless, um, um, useless intuitively for biological or cell size things because a meter squared is, you know, bigger than you are. Um, so, so uh, it turns out that, a, that one Pascal or one Newton per meter squared is the same as one piconewton per micron squared. And so that's useful to know molecularly because a piconewton is about the amount of force that a single motor molecule can, can achieve. Uh, maybe like one to 10 piconewtons. So myosin, kinesin, all these molecular motors that, that put forces, they typically you know, can produce about a few piconewtons of force. And so imagine uh, and a square micron is kind of a biggish part of a cell. Um, a typical molecule, how big is a typical molecule? Like a typical myosin molecule, how big is it? If the, if, the mo if, the, if the myosin is pulling on something, it's applying a piconewton of force over how big an area? How big is a uh, like a piece of, mo um, of a uh, 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 typical 100 kilodalton-ish kind of protein? Any intuition? A couple nanometers, maybe five nanometers, five to 10 nanometers. Okay, that's about, so a lot of these mo molecules are really long, so myosin is maybe 100 nanometers long or 50 nanometers long, but, but a typical cross-section of a molecular interaction is a couple of nanometers squared. Uh, okay, um, so that's kind of useful to know. And it's pretty simple. So force divided by area is stress. Um, and stress is given in, new, in units of, of Pascal. The slightly more subtle thing is that this other quantity, strain. Strain is a uh, uh, geometrically well-defined quantity that, it, that tells you how much a material was deformed. <coughs> and, but, and you can sort of get a very good intuitive feel for what strain is for really simple sized objects. So let's say you have a cube. You start with a cube of jello or something or fat and you apply force tangentially to the top surface. So the cube has a height of, of h, the area of this thing is h squared. If we put a force f uh, pulling this surface with respect to the fixed bottom surface, that's a stress of f divided by h squared, so that's good. Uh, but now what's the strain? If, let's say we put that much force and the object goes from this uh, initially uh, um, uh, square cross section to this sort of rhomboid uh, 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 front face. How are we going to how to quantify the amount of deformation? So the strain is more or less. In for a, for a simple cube, it's the amount that you have moved the uh, front surface. Uh, this little delta x, the amount that the thing deformed from its initial position to its uh, final position on the top surface divided by the height of the, of the material. So 20% strain is about this. One fifth, if, if you have something that's one unit high and you push it 20% this way, that's about a 20% strain. And the thing that gets a little bit uh, um, wearisome is that most biological tissues are not cubes, they're not these simple shapes. Even something like a cylinder or a cone shaped thing gets to be a little bit uh, complicated. But strain is basically always the same thing. It's just the, the way that uh, you have to integrate over the volumes to quantify it gets more, more, more complicated. And I, I guess it's a useful thing to, to think that, um, or to remember that most biological deformations, so soft things in your body are deformed uh, by tens tens of percents easily. So you're flexing your muscles or sitting in your butt deforms the tissue in there, not like 1% or 100%, but something like 10 to 50% more or less. Um, okay, so is that clear? Okay, so the cartoon I showed you is for shear deformation, uh, but you can also deform things as I mentioned in uni uniaxially. So if you do the same thing and you take a little cube and you apply the force perpendicular to the sample, either by stretching it or compressing it. You can take this initially uh, square-like cross-section and uh, 
uh, elongate it, right? In shear, you may get it into this sort of little rhombus uh, thing. This becomes from a square to a rectangle, okay? But the same sort of thing uh, uh, um, happens. The strain, I'm sorry, let me go back here. In shear deformation, shear strains are often given by uh, gamma. Stress is almost always sigma, lowercase sigma. A strain in shear is usually a gamma. Um, if, you're, if you've taken fluid mechanics or soft matter mechanics, you know that this, the parameters are, are slightly more, I'm oversimplifying here, but, but I sort of can't help it. But the strain in uniaxial deformation is usually given by a little epsilon. But it's the same thing. It's the degree that you uh, increase the length divided by the initial length. And an important thing is that the th this strain unit is dimensionless. It's one length divided by another. So there are no dimensions in strain. So strain is e either given by just a plain number between 0 and 1 or 2 or something, or it's given in percents. Uh, but it doesn't have a unit. And so the, the elastic modulus, the thing that is the equivalent to a spring constant, the thing that people generally mean by stiffness, is called the uh, elastic modulus, the, mo uh, the ratio of stress to strain. Okay? The elastic modulus also has units of Pascal, because stress is in Pascal and strain is in nothing. Right? Okay? That makes sense? Okay. So that's where all those p pictures you looked at of, I mean, the, the examples you, of you looked at uh, before of you know, the few hundred pascal for the, uh, for the liver, the kind of megapascal to gigapascal for the cell wall, that's where all these come from. You put a f certain force over a defined area and you measure how much the stuff deformed. Okay. But it's never as simple as that. There are a million ways to uh, deform things. Uh, uh, this is what I just showed you. You can take the same sample and subject it either to a shear strain, either constant or oscillating. You can compress it or stretch it. And in the body, typically thing, both things happen at the same time. When you compress a tissue, the cells in them are constantly trying to put attraction stress on the world that they live in. So as you put more and more uniaxial stress um, on the cells in your cartilage or by standing up or whatnot, the cell is, is, is simultaneously applying shear stresses to the uh, world around it. So when you compress it, uh, you can still put a shear deformation on it. And that combination of uniaxial uh, strains and shear strains happens all the time. And, 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 it, and it's, it's turned out to, to be uh, something worth, uh, worth looking at. Okay, and again, as I mentioned, force can be either uh, constant or oscillatory. So in the very, very simplest case, where something is purely elastic, that is, and, uh, and by elastic, that doesn't mean just stretchable. An elastic object is an object which, after you stretch it or deform it in any way, once you take the force off, that object returns to its initial uh, 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 shape, right? There's no change, there's no, pl there's no uh, irreversible deformation. An object like that, that's just kind of like a spring, if you do a simple experiment and you put a constant stress on it, that thing will develop a constant strain that's time independent. And from that you calculate the modulus. You divide stress by strain, you get a modulus. Often, for convenience sake, people don't put constant forces on it, they put dynamic forces on it, they wiggle it and uh, to simulate heart beating or something else. And very often the apparent stiffness is a strong function of the frequency at which you uh, wiggle. And so you put an oscillating uh, uh, stress that is a blue line. And for a perfectly elastic object, you get an oscillating strain, the red line, uh, that sits right on top of uh, with the same uh, phase as the uh, um, um, stress was applied. And from, again, the same, the, from the ratio of the maximum strain to the maximum stress, you can calculate a shear modulus. Okay, now, most stuff isn't purely elastic. It's uh, kind of both. Um, for a purely viscous thing, uh, if you, you know, honey or something like that, um, if you apply a constant stress to a purely viscous material, the strain is just constantly increasing, right? So the viscosity is the slope of the strain divided by time. 
whereas for elastic modulus, uh, elastic object, the thing is a constant with respect to time. And when you do these oscillatory measurements, there's a phase shift in between uh, the stress and the strain that's exactly one quarter of the period. But most things in the body are some mix of the two things. Almost everything that we're built out of is, is viscoelastic. So there's some viscous loss, there's some elastic uh, restoring force. So in real life, if you put a constant stress on a piece of fat or liver or something, the strain will increase slowly over some period of time and then it will either reach a maximum and stay there or it'll just keep going forever and ever. Uh, not linearly, but kind of differently. And again, the phase shift in between the stress and the strain isn't either, it's neither zero nor is it uh, uh, period over four, it's someplace in the middle. Okay. So that's, if you do these experiments, that's just kind of uh, uh, a matter of life. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'm, uh, the next couple slides are things in case you uh, want reminders in the notes will be uh, uh, definitions of all this jargon. So I want to finish with a couple of places where this stuff becomes uh, important. So I mentioned already that there's fluid shear stress in the blood vessels, there's stretch and tension during breathing, uh, muscle contraction, all kinds of stuff, and stiffness changes in the tissue and that can uh, um, uh, make environmentally dependent, uh, uh, you know, uh, tissue differences, and there's a lot of compressive uh, stresses in bone and other things. So I, I won't have time to go through everything, but I do want to show you a couple of examples. Here's what I, what I showed you before of, of not just the computed um, uh, shear stress that you feel that, that endothelial cells in a bifurcated kind of uh, vessel would feel, but it's superimposed on top of the one of the uh, uh, effects of, of cells feeling um, shear stress is they make nitric oxide or they activate nitric oxide synthase. And so you can uh, um, uh, relate areas of local shear stress change to places where there's uh, local induction of this important uh, mediator. But, but again, there are many, many things uh, that uh, could be in this colored form. All kinds of stuff changes uh, when you change shear stress. And one of the more spectacular ones it was actually largely uh, uh, worked on by the guy whose uh, um, office is just below us, uh, um, uh, Peter Davies. One of the mo more wonderful things that happens, even in culture, if you take endothelial cells and make a monolayer of them, if you just put them in a dish with medium on top, they'll make this kind of irregular sort of cobblestone-ish um, uh, uh, morphology that doesn't really look like what it looks like in the in the endothelium in the in an actual blood vessel. But if you put on shear force, if you just start flowing the medium on top, these these cells will spontaneously um, make these really nice uh, elongated patterns. And if you put not regular flow, not laminar shear flow like on the side of a tube or in a along a, a big uh, uh, regular vessel but you start putting obstacles, either a bifurcation or a big uh, plug of cholesterol or whatever, and, and, can, and, and generate either turbulent flow or at least doesn't have to be turbulent, it just has to be non-uniform, then you, you lose this nice uh, uh, um, uh, elongated pattern. And many other things change. Uh, the, the cell cell contacts change, all kinds of stuff changes, simply in, resp in response to this force. Yeah. I, you might know this. I don't. I. I don't know. I don't think so. I think it just becomes decoupled. Yeah. Once you don't have, once the time constant of the irregularity gets big enough, you just decouple. The cell doesn't know what direction the flow is. Is that is that right? Um, so and it's it's and it happens fairly abruptly. And the other thing that, that this is modulated by, of course, is the stiffness of the extracellular matrix and the stuff underneath the cells. So if these cells are sitting in a uh, particularly uh, stiff arterial wall, uh, they will respond to these shear stresses differently from if they are sitting on a very soft arterial wall. Okay, so what controls the stiffness? Not surprisingly, the stiffness is controlled by the cytoskeleton and the extracellular matrix, more or less. And so there's been a lot of uh, efforts to try to understand the basic physics of uh, polymer networks such as those that make the ECM or the 
or the cytoskeleton, and what they all have in common is that they're all these so-called semi-flexible filaments. So here's an actin network just inside a uh, leukocyte. Uh, here are some fibroblasts crawling through a collagen gel. Um, if you sort of step back and look at sort of different scales, I haven't shown you the length scale, but this is about 100 nanometers. This is a couple of microns. Uh, so this is a much bigger structure than this is, but they basically look the same kind of slightly curved but almost straight fibers that are connected with a connectivity of about four. Uh, and it turns out that the physics of these networks is kind of um, is, is, is kind of interesting and it's very, very different from the mechanical response of things like rubber or polyacrylamide or, or, or things that are made out of flexible polymers. And these guys are everywhere and so they're not simply um, uh, fibers that interconnect the things inside individual cells. There are cytoskeletal elements, um, largely uh, intermediate filaments, uh, that link one cell to another. So this is a monolayer of epithelial cells. And these little green guys are intermediate filaments. And I think you can make out, I hope you can make out, the blue is a membrane dye. So, and these little black spots are nuclei, so, uh, or paranuclear areas. And so all of these cells, there are many cells in this thing, but there's one continuous network of fibers because everywhere that these fibers come from the uh, nuclear surface down to the edge, Right on the other side of that nuclear uh, cell cell con or that sort of that cell cell contact is another fiber of the same type coming in the other direction. So even if you dissolved all the cell membranes, this would still be a continuous uh, sheet of elastic material because of these fibers are connected to each other from one cell to another. And so that kind of thing is partly responsible for uh, uh, for the mechanics of, of a lot of tissues, a lot of epithelial tissues in the gut and your skin. And, and you may know that if, you, if people that with mutations, either in the, in the cytoskeletal polymers, in this case it's keratin, either mutations in the network that disrupt, or the, the, the protein that disrupt this structure, or, or mutations in the um, transmembrane proteins that link this cell to another, those give rise to these uh, uh, blistering diseases uh, that uh, uh, um, uh, arise from the fact that these uh, epithelial sheets can no longer uh, withstand uh, deform you know, deforming forces. It's also true in the heart and the artery. Let me pop over and, and uh, uh, get to what I wanted to show you. Okay, so a couple more things about, about measurements of stiffness and elasticity. These, those kind of early cartoon pictures I showed you are, give you the uh, impression that the stiffness of a material just depends on the magnitude of stress and the, def well it does, it's defined by the relation between the stress and the strain. But that ratio of stress to strain isn't a constant. It's not just a number that defines liver compared to the brain compared to the bone. That spring constant, which for simple objects is a constant. So if you, you, know, if you buy a spring, that's, or if you buy an AFM cantilever or something, that thing has a spring constant written down for it that defines how stiff it is. And that stiffness is the same whether you deform it a little bit or a lot. So if you deform it, if you want to deform a spring twice as much, you know, two units instead of one unit, you know you have to pull twice as hard. You have to put too much, twi twice as much force. So it turns out that biological networks like those I showed you don't have that, that feature. They are remarkably nonlinear. So their, their stiffness, their shear modulus depends remarkably strongly on how, f str how much you deform them on the shear strain. So what I, what I told you before is, is shown here. If you take something that is a simple object, like a polyacrylamide gel, that just has a constant stiffness, and that stiffness is the same whether you deform it, you know, half a percent or 150 percent. As long as you don't break it, it's the same number. Yes? Is that true by definition for all viscoelastic material? No, no, it's really interesting. I mean, I mean, I mean this nonlinearity? Yeah, it's not true for all viscoelastic materials. So there are, so viscoelastic materials typically have a elastic modulus that depends a lot on the time scale, on how long you keep it deformed. But it does not necessarily depend on how far you deform it. So if you do one of these viscoelastic oscillatory measurements, 
the ratio of stress to strain depends a lot on the uh, frequency of the, uh, of the measurement. It doesn't necessarily depend on the amplitude. So those two things are separate from each other. And these objects are interesting because the, uh, these purified networks are almost perfectly elastic. So they aren't particularly time dependent. So for something like a collagen network or an actin network, uh, if, it's, if it's well cross-linked, the shear modulus does not depend, if this was time on the x-axis, it would be flat. It's only strain where this is important. And um, this feature of becoming stiffer the more you um, uh, deform it uh, means that, um, that if you make materials out of this, you have a very nice, clever mechanism to change the local stiffness. You can make something softer or stiffer, not by polymerizing more things or by crossing it more density, but just to put forces on it. So one of the strat strategies that, that at least nature has in its toolbox is to change the local stiffness by putting tension. So I mentioned before that blood clots with normal platelets are much stiffer than blood clots without them. And that's the reason why, that the functioning platelet puts internal stress. So it's as though you're, uh, here's a fiber network, the platelets have kind of ridden up this uh, strain uh, curve uh, to put extra deformation on the network and sort of pull the slack out of the soft fibers. And that's why it's stiffer. And the moment that you let go of that force, it just pops back to the softness. So it's a, it's a rapidly reversible mechanism that um, um, you know, biological things have at their disposal to change stiffness. Does this, uh, do these curves collapse if you normalize it by like, mesh size or coon length? Or like yeah. yeah, yeah, they do. If you, all you have to know is, is mesh size and yeah, that's, that's a great, great insight. Yeah, if you know the stiffness of the fiber and you know the mesh size, uh, which depends on the concentration, then all these things look basically the same. There are a couple of differences, but, but um, the other thing which matters is at the place where they hook up, is that connectivity, you know, are the crosslinks X-shaped or Y-shaped? Uh, um, and, uh, or, or they really should be um, like a three-dimensional crosslink to be really stable. But biological things are not connected as, as, as uh, much as they should be to make a three-dimensional elastic object, um, but they're on the verge. Um, okay. Yes? The reason for the strain thickening is because collagen, uh, in response to LMP2s or like cross-linkers, changes when strain is applied, or it's just like natural material tendency? It's, it's just natural material tendency. So there are, two, there, there are two mechanisms by which this happens. The simplest one is that imagine you have these semi-flexible things that that are cross-linked at these four places, and here are the fibers in between the cross-link nodes. And the fiber is almost straight, but not quite. And if you pull on it at the beginning, you're just pulling out the kind of local folds in the fiber. But eventually, you pull it out so that one of these fibers, the one that's diagonal to the shear force direction, is completely straight. And once that happens, then it gets stiffer. And there's also just a geometric argument that if you just had a network of sticks, things that are um, in this direction and you try to def you know, strain the material like this, that, that stick can deform by bending. And bending is pretty soft. But this stick uh, can only deform by stretching. So the more you deform it, the more you shift the relaxation modes from bending to stretching. And that that'll also account for it. So those two things uh, often conspire. So let me, let me uh, uh, quickly tell, uh, 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 show you a couple of examples and then show you a couple of cartoon pictures of how people measure this stuff. So this example I like for the plant uh, people because it's one experiment on plants. Or not, well, fruits anyway, grapes and mangoes. So I mentioned before that like when you sit down, you're compressing your soft tissues, but the cells in there are trying to uh, put traction stress on them. So that's exactly what we've done with uh, uh, grape and mango. And uh, so here's a shear modulus um, measured in this small def you know, oscillatory way as a function of how much uniaxial s stress we apply to the, to the tissue, to the, either the grape or the mango, or we've done this with persimmons and all kinds of other stuff. And there's a really interesting relation, which is theoretically totally not understood, that the shear modulus is just linearly related to the axial stress. The more you compress these things, the stiffer they get.
And the moment you take the, the compression off, it pops back. And uh, uh, presumably this is important for packaging and transporting fruits and whatnot. Uh, but the, the thing that isn't understood is that almost all of these relations, this one is mango, I guess. Um, uh, here's the uh, stiffness as a function of stress. They're all linear and they all have different slopes. Um, so, uh, so for the theorists, this is something to figure out. Okay, let me finish by a couple of, of, of um, uh, summaries. Or should I do this or just leave it? Um, depends how long it will take. Two minutes. Okay, let me show you a couple of, uh, so the, the tools of the trade that some of you will run into are atomic force microscopy, uh, cell aspiration, um, uh, or uh, uh, using optical or magnetic tweezers. And so cell indentation with an AFM is exactly what I showed you before. It's just taking your finger and poking it into the top surface of the cell, except that the finger is a kind of a nanoscale um, a sharp tip or a bead, and you put uh, a force and a displacement on it, and from the slope of this line, more or less, uh, uh, you calculate the uh, uh, stress-strain relation. It's a really commonly used, people see this all the time. And one of its advantages is that you can make a very fine stiffness map. Here's one protruding part of a cell. This length bar uh, scales about a micron, or five microns or so, and every one of these pixels is an individual stiffness uh, measurement. So you can get a very nicely, um, uh, spatially localized stiffness map. A kind of cruder, a much older and uh, but still remarkably useful uh, device is to take something like a red cell or any cell and suck it into a pipette. From the suction pressure, you know the force per area that you apply to this part of the cell. From the part that protruded into the tube, you can calculate in a complicated way the strain. And from, again, the stress-strain relation, you can get an idea of the stiffness of the of the edge of the cell. Uh, people have become really good at putting individual cells in between two parallel plates and then doing exactly what I showed you for macroscopic rheology. And in a much more high-tech way, you can focus uh, uh, a laser beam to a very small spot and the optical, uh, uh, basically the momentum that's lost by photons uh, bouncing off the uh, refractive particle. Uh, can trap it in here and apply a force to it, and, and this will allow you to, to apply piconewton-ish forces, um, uh, or maybe nanonewton-ish forces, eh, maybe not that much, but uh, uh, very small, uh, almost molecular scale forces uh, to little beads and, uh, and watch the, uh, either move those inside a cell or look at how uh, um, molecular motors pull on them. This, by the way, was first uh, uh, used in plant cells. It was used to trap a nucleus in a big uh, transparent plant cell and yank it around the, uh, uh, the cytoplasm. And the, the, uh, uh, the, the most ancient and sort of fantastic and still highly utilized uh, method is to stick little pieces of mag magnet inside a cell. This is from the 1920s. People had already done this. And then you put a magnetic field. You can either shove the particle inside the cell or attach it to, the, to integrins or other objects on the outside of the cell, put a magnetic uh, field on it, a field gradient, and yank on these particles and do two things. Look at what that force does for the cell signaling, and by looking at the displacement of the particle, uh, figure out how stiff the cell is. And you can do that either uniaxially, or you can embed these uh, beads into the cell and put slightly more uh, complicated electromagnetic currents and twist the bead rather than pull up and down to put shear rather than elongation. Okay, so that's it. There's more. There's more stuff on the uh, on the uh, uh, lecture notes um, if you need it. <laughs>